Inside Crime is brought to you by doTERRA. The doTERRA drug deactivation system helps stop opioid misuse before it starts. With doTERRA, unused prescription opioids and other drugs are gone for good. I'm Angeline Hartman. As a journalist, I've worked with cops and victims of crime all over the country. My craft is storytelling. My passion is crime fighting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Inside Crime. Today's episode is related to one of the deadliest terrorist attacks in the United States. We're not talking about the 9-11 attacks in 2001. Six years before that, on April 19, 1995, a truck full of explosives was detonated in front of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. 168 people, including 19 children in the building's daycare, were killed. The Oklahoma City bombing is the deadliest incident of domestic terrorism in our country's history. There's one iconic image from that day. It's a photograph of a firefighter carrying a baby. She's covered in blood, and her tiny legs are dangling from his arms. Her name was Bailey Allman. She had just turned one year old the day before the bombing. She did not survive. That image became a heartbreaking symbol of that tragic day. The photograph won the 1996 Pulitzer Prize for Spot News Photography. The firefighter was Captain Chris Fields. He was thrown into the spotlight, unprepared for what would follow. On today's episode of Inside Crime, we talk to Chris Fields about that day and how that photograph changed his life. First, a look back at April 19, 1995. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building, killing children, killing federal employees, military men, and civilians. Social Security uh, waiting room had uh, 24 clients in it that morning, but all 24 died. It's hard to describe, I mean, knowing that someone could do that to us. The chaos in downtown Oklahoma City did indeed resemble Beirut after what police believed to be a 1,200-pound car bomb ripped through the nine-story federal building shortly after 9 o'clock this morning. More than 500 people were already in their offices, and at least 50 children were in a daycare center on the second floor. Authorities now believe the truck that bore the bomb was parked in a space alongside the federal building. A second vehicle may have been nearby to permit the bombers to escape. Former President Bill Clinton quoted Nelson Mandela during his remarks. He taught me that in the face of tragedy, evil, and loss, there are only two things that always remain that can ever be taken away, your mind and your heart. It was the worst terrorist act in American history. It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Fields to Inside Crime. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So congratulations on retirement. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, March 1st, 2017, I retired after almost 32 years on the fire department. Do you miss it? What do you think? How's retirement going? Retirement's going fantastic. Uh, yeah, you you miss it. I, that's what I tell guys that ask me now. Uh, the main things I miss now are chow time and shift change because that's uh, that's pretty much the fellowship time you know I, so i don't i really don't miss the being away for 24 hours and getting up and down all night and all that but i miss i miss the guys and the girls i worked with but i've been staying busy with um still working for a company selling a little fire equipment and starting to do a little speaking about some ptsd -ish issues and then me and the wife are empty nesting a little bit so we we travel when we get the chance What's the situation? You're you're starting to speak out? I was diagnosed with PTSD um, several years after the bombing and just went through some pretty uh, tumultuous times in my life, uh, including my family and friends and 
and stuff and was able to, you know, reach out and get the help I needed and, uh, was always looking for a reason of why I was going through what I was going through. And, uh, I think I found that reason it's to, uh, to go out and, and to let other first responders know that if they do experience what I did, not saying everybody will, but if they do, that there, there's avenues to, to get help and carry on and have a great life. Yeah. Well, PTSD is more common, I think, than people realize, but your story is unique. Can you take us back to that day, April 19th, 1995, and give us a little bit of background? Uh, certainly. It was, uh, like you said, April 19th, 1995. Um, most people don't know. It sticks out in my mind, though. It was a Wednesday because uh, at the fire station that morning, uh, guys were doing the yard work around the station. That was what we did on Wednesdays at the station. So that's why I will always remember the day of the week. Yeah. And uh, about nine o'clock, me and other officers were in there discussing what we were going to go to the store to get for breakfast that day. And we felt and heard the explosion. The um, station windows rattled. Uh, I was at a station that was about 14 blocks north of the Murrah building, the bomb site. Um, we looked outside and saw a large plume of smoke coming from that area, the downtown area. We knew that we would be dispatched just because of the location of where we were and where we saw the plume of smoke. So we self-dispatched ourselves. So it's a little bit after nine o'clock and you just hear a blast or you hear what, what is the moment of impact for you? What does that look like and sound like for you guys? And what are you doing at that moment? Um, Let's say it was about nine o'clock and we were just standing, standing around the kitchen. And, uh, I mean, it was a, a, as a loud as explosion, boom, whatever you want to call it, as I had ever heard. And the, the station rattled the windows. I mean, there was actually some structural damage to our fire station. And, uh, like I say, we were 14 blocks away and, um, uh, we thought at first, really, we ran outside. We thought it, there was a uh, Borden's ice cream plant right by our station mm -hmm. that had tr uh, train tracks where trains would stop and unload. And we thought a train had derailed, honestly, and came and hit the station. I mean, it rattled. Mm -hmm. It shook the station that much. And um, that's when we went outside. We happened to see the plume of smoke and uh, in the downtown area. And that's where we were, just 14 blocks north of downtown. And we self-dispatched ourselves. We probably got about six or seven, eight blocks away. I remember getting on the radio and reporting that we already had buildings with damage and glass busted out of all the storefronts. Uh, Broadway was a street, had a lot of uh, mercantile uh, businesses, and a lot of the storm, win uh, their windows were already blown out. So um, at that time, everybody's thinking, you know, natural gas explosion. Right. There was, a, there was a construction, there was some construction going on in the area across the street. So everybody thought maybe a, uh, a welder's torch, you know, a settling tank or something had, you know, exploded. So, um, once we got on the scene, um, first assignment we got, we went and helped, uh, Oklahoma city police officers get a lady out of a basement. Um, she was on a certain side of the building where all nine fours weren't pancaked. So she was actually in a safe part of the basement, but she was she was trapped by some uh, pipes and stuff like that. So we got her out. I imagine you you just he you're heading out to the scene. You self dispatch. You don't know even where you're going yet. Right. You don't know it's the federal building. That you don't know what's happened. So at what point is it dawning on you the magnitude of? the situation the magnitude of the situation as far as what we were dealing with really didn't uh kind of hit you until you actually saw the the, the building till you actually saw and i'm saying as we were walking up we were walking on all sorts of debris and glass and car parts and i mean everything and there were still tons of debris floating floating down as far as knowing that it was a a bomb that had went off we we never knew that until maybe a couple hours, maybe an hour or so into the operation, they evacuated everybody because they said they thought they found a second explosive device. And I think that was all of our reaction was, 
we didn't know there was a first explosive device. I mean, we were never told that that it was that's what it was until until we were evacuated because they thought they found another explosive device. So well, I imagine you're just dealing with everything, trying to get people out, rescuing people, and nobody's telling you the what's in the whys. You're just trying to respond. Uh, exactly. That magnitude of, of the damage that, you know, you can see now and look at pictures. You're talking about nine stories, you know, uh, pancake down on top of each other. You could tell right away it was going to be a very large scale incident. And uh, and I, this not to sound uh, horrible or take away anything from the people that lost their loved ones, but to to walk away from that with only 168 fatalities was, was to see the damage firsthand and to, to see that there was only 168 fatalities was shocking. I understand what you're saying. Can you describe to me the chaos that you were seeing or, or was it not chaos? Maybe if it was just quiet, what, what was it when you were, as you said, you were walking up? Um, it, I've often in, in several interviews that I've done, I've often described it as a, uh, a I'm trying to think of the example, a scene. Um, I have to take it back when I was little, when I was little and I'd go to the movie theater and they'd show like the blob or previews of blob. But it showed these people like running, running, running away from a theater, you know, I've, that kind of the, that preview the black and white blo the blob where they're yeah. running out of the movie theater. Yes. Right. Yes. That is it right there. Times 100. It was, wow. it was, uh, there was lots of walking wounded and, and where we kind of the way we parked, we were, there was a slight little hill on fifth street is where Murrah building was. And, uh, so when we first parked the rig where we were parked, it's one of the deals where you can see maybe the top of the building, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a couple of floors, but we couldn't see the front of the building. So we really had no idea until we topped that hill and got down there and, uh, but the, the, the look on the people's faces that were running away told you everything. I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier, but you started to say one of the first things that you did when you got there, you didn't really know what you were dealing with as far as like what I don't think anybody did, right? I mean, right. they're just dealing with the chaos. What is in your mind? You're just like, we just got to get people out. We got to get in there and get them out or what? And that's sometimes the hard thing about our job. You know what you want to do, but you can't... Uh, you know, we're just trained not to freelance. And I mean, because if, if I'd have probably had my way, I'd have probably went back down that basement, look for any more, see if there's any more people trapped. But uh, we had got an assignment to go to the other other end of the building. Because like I say, we're in the first 15, 20 minutes of the incident. So we're still in, uh, we're still in rescue mode. You know, we haven't switched to recovery mode yet. So that first 30 minutes, there was a lot of freelancing going on with people trying to help, you know, trying to get citizens that were trying to help get them out of the way. And, uh, you know, so the police are trying to do their part to help rescue and search. And they're also trying to keep people back, set up a perimeter. So that first 30 or 45 minutes was probably, I don't even know if it was organized chaos. It was probably just chaos. Did you realize it was when you got there that that was the building that you knew right away that that was the, the federal building, right? And this is a building with hundreds of people and a daycare once we got there, we knew it was the Murrah building. Really, about the only people that knew probably there was a daycare in that building were the employees and the people that kids stayed in that daycare. Like when they were talking about the daycare, we were thinking, yeah, it's over here at the YMCA. And they were, and then that's when uh, a report from a, I can't remember if it was a police officer or a firefighter that reported uh, they're finding lots of babies. And that's when somebody came on and said, there is a daycare on the second floor of the, of the Murrah building. Oh my gosh. Hmm. So then what happens, Chris? After we got the lady out of the basement, that's when uh, we were assigned to go around to the other side of the building. And um, as we were making our way to the building, I mean, out of nowhere, this guy appears and, he says he has a critical infant and that was, uh, of course, you know, now that I know who it is, it was a police officer named John Avery. Um, he was in street clothes, so I didn't recognize him as an officer, but uh, he said he had a critical infant and 
you know, I still, like I say to this day, I don't know why my mom says God's hand was in it and everything, but I said, here, I'll, I'll take her. And, uh, talking to Sergeant Avery, you know, later in the years and we're still good friends. Uh, he said, I was about the third or fourth person that he came to saying, you know, like here, help me. Uh, 1995 was a time when not many police officers were medically trained. There's probably a lot more now that are at least EMTs or, you know, have some medical training. So he said, I was just, he said, I knew firemen were, you know, medically trained. He said, I was looking for anybody, you know, to give this baby to. And like I said, for some reason I said, here, I'll take her. And, um, I didn't find any signs of life. She had a slight kind of open skull fracture and, uh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. I just want to make sure I got it right because when you first started telling me the story, uh -huh. I didn't. I didn't want to assume anything, so I didn't realize that he had the baby with him. So he's got the baby, and he's like, "Can you take this baby from me?" Basically, is that right? He's holding the baby, like you. Yeah. Like, can you help me visualize what's happening? Yeah. So there's... you turn the corner. So you turn the corner. Uh huh. And, and okay. walk me through that. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Me and my four other guys, or three other guys, are walking down the sidewalk to the other side of the building, and. Like I say, it's like he, I mean, I didn't see if he came around the corner, if he came out of a door, he was just in front of us. I mean, just bam. And he said, I have a critical infant. There actually is a photo of him handing me Bailey. He is, he's, uh, he's, hand, he's, his arms are extended and mine are extended and he's, he's handed me Bailey. And, um, uh, and, you know, talking to Sergeant Avery later in the years, it wasn't even. I don't even think he got Bailey out. I think it was kind of a, they had kind of a, a, a chain gang, for lack of a better term, a line set up because they were digging children out or people out and then handing them because it was, you know, too hard to just walk out with somebody. So they were like handing them down a, like a line. And, uh, my he gosh, got, he got Bailey and he said he did what he needed knew to do to check for any signs of life and he couldn't find anybody or find any signs of life. That's why he was looking to get her to somebody that was maybe more medically trained that could maybe, you know, find something. So. So he encounters you, he's got the baby. Yes. He, um, like I said, he says he has a critical infant and I could tell he was looking for, for help. I mean, you could just hear it in his voice, see it in his face. And he was, Basically, his arms were extended like he was handing her to me as he was saying it. So I just, you know, I said, here, I'll take her. And that's the first thing I did was look for any signs of life. She, you know, had to clear some um, insulation and stuff out of her throat. And like I said, she had a little slight open skull fracture and I couldn't find any, any signs of life. I looked up and there was an ambulance had set up across the street. So um, I took her over there and... Uh, told the paramedic that was on the ambulance. He was actually treating somebody. I said, Hey, I have a critical infant here. And the ambulance was full. They had, uh, they had a patient in each, uh, on each kind of what they call a side bench. And then they had the stretcher in the middle of the ambulance, but had a patient on it. And they had two patients on the ground outside the ambulance. And he looked up at me and said, well, hold on just a second. We're not going to put that baby on the ground. And he, he went into, he was stepped inside the ambulance to get a blanket so we could put it on the ground. And when I'm standing there looking at her while he's, uh, I think he was telling me and he was getting up to get the blanket. And that's when apparently the photo was taken. Who knew that that photo would be the symbol, the iconic photo of that day? Yeah, it's, uh, it, that's pretty much what it's come to represent. Bailey was the baby and Aaron is Bailey's mom. Now, that was kind of Aaron's view of it. It came to symbolize, you know, I wasn't just a firefighter. I was all the rescuers there and Bailey wasn't just Bailey Almond. Uh, she was representing all the, all the innocence that was lost that day. You're right. It just took off and that became the, that became the symbol of the Oklahoma City bombing. Inside Crime is brought to you by doTERRA. 
The doTERRA drug deactivation system is an independently tested, safe, and environmentally sound solution that permanently deactivates, destroys, and disposes of unneeded pills, patches, liquids, creams, and films right at home. Be part of the solution to reduce drug abuse. Learn more at deterrasystem.com. I wasn't just a firefighter. I was all the rescuers there. And Bailey wasn't just Bailey Almond. Uh, she was representing all the all the innocents that was lost that day. You're right. It just took off, and that became the that became the symbol of the Oklahoma City bombing. That moment when it happens. Did you know it was happening at that moment? No, I, I had no idea that there was a uh, photo even taken until we got back to the station at 11 o'clock that night. But when you look at that photo, so it's imp- so for me to ask you, what were you thinking at that moment? You wouldn't know because you don't know when that photo was exactly taken. I, I know exactly what I was thinking when I was looking down on her. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Looking at the photo, when I see the whole photo and, and see the ambulance guy, or I see the paramedic, I, I know that was right after I told him I had a critical infant and he's telling me, well, hold on, we're going to get a blanket because we're not going to put that baby on the ground. Um, and when I'm looking at her, I mean, I know the same thing I was thinking from the moment I took her from Sergeant Avery was that, uh, that somebody's, somebody's world is getting ready to be turned upside down. Um, you know, my oldest son, who's, <clears throat> excuse me, who's 25 now has just turned two, you know, and Bailey had just turned one the day before the bombing. So, you know, I, I, I just couldn't imagine what, the, what this parent parents or parent was getting ready to go through when they found out that their, their baby was, was dead. And then to look back and not realize that that same scenario was going to be played out 168 times that day. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. But that, that picture was a Pulitzer prize winning photo. Yes. For many reasons. Um, but how, how did that photo impact you? On the outside, nobody would ever know. Cause that was just who I was and how I played things. But, uh, on the inside, it was, I really came to resent it for a long time. Uh, I struggled a lot with the guilt of, of being the last one to hold her baby. Um, because I know in talking to her that even when she had to identify baby, she didn't get to hold her or touch her. Guilt is a, is a pretty powerful thing, whether it's deserved or not deserved. And, and when your mind is telling you you deserve it, whether you do it or not, it's, it's pretty crushing you know, I had no control over it, but then again, like I said, my mind, the guilt, and then the guilt of what Aaron was going through because of her baby being uh, on the cover of countless magazines and newspapers, and and so she had to relive it every single day. Uh, people in stores coming up to her and recognizing her and talking to her, and so I, I carried that guilt a lot. And then uh, first responders is such a team effort and being, being singled out, uh, you know, and the word hero is always used. And that's, that's just not what we do. I mean, it's a calling to, to do what we do. And so I'm no different than I re- really, you know, that scene, like I said, that, that particular moment of somebody having to, handle, carry, hold a deceased person was carried out 167 other times that day. And so being singled out was, was really hard, really hard. Because your moment memorialized that day for the nation, really. Right. And, and like I said, and that was, uh, it was tough being singled out for that photo. Yeah. What happened after that, Chris? After that, uh, I caught up with my crew who uh, was in the process of uh, getting a lady out that was trapped, actually talking with her and communicating with her. Um, I remember her name. Her name was Sheila Driver. She was 28 years old. She was pregnant. I remember it like it was yesterday. It's like talking to her. We did find out the next day 
that she passed away on the way to the hospital, her and her uh, unborn child. For us, that was the last, what we call rescue of the day. Everything else was, was recovery mode the rest of the day until we got released to go back to the fire station about, about 11, 10 30, 11 o'clock that night. And like I say, again, that's when I found out from a phone call from our dispatch office that there was even a photo existing. So what do they say to you? Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, was the chief over the dispatch office. He called our station and, um, uh, he said, Hey, Chris, did you, he said, I got a photo fax to me. He said, it's kind of grainy cause it's on the fax. He said, but did, uh, you carry a baby out of the building? I said, no, no, Harvey, I didn't. I said, a gentleman handed me a baby. I said, but I didn't carry a baby out. He said, well, the AP faxes photo and they want to identify the firefighter. He said, I've talked to the fire chief and the chief said, if we can identify who it is to go ahead. And there was three captains at my station. We all had red helmets with fives on them. That's what he told me. Helmet with a five on it. So I asked the other two and captains and they both said no they didn't carry a baby or anything like that that day so i went back and told harvey i said harvey it's yes i guess it's me i said where where does come from and he said well it's a guy from the ap and he said this picture is getting ready to go worldwide and i hung up the phone guys at the station said what was that all about i said i don't know i said some photo i said and kind of jokingly like firefighters do i said i guess i'm going worldwide boys kind of jokingly not having really any idea that it really meant worldwide. <laughs> you were going worldwide. All right. Yeah. And, uh, saw it for the first time the next morning. Uh, uh, the other shift came in, uh, our daily paper here, the daily Oklahoma and had it as a little, uh, inset picture on the front page, but then like the USA today. And, uh, I think had it on the front page and then, We were kind of sitting there drinking coffee, of course, watching all the, you know, the national news shows just to see the coverage of it. And uh, every almost lead in story talked about that photo and was just showing all these different newspapers and magazines from around the world as that being on the cover. So that's when I kind of realized that, wow, it really did go worldwide. Uh, I immediately thought about Aaron, or in that case, I thought about the baby's parents. I didn't know how the process worked. I didn't know if they had identified her yet. I didn't know anything. So I thought, oh my God, these people are going to wake up. And and in my heart, in my mind, I was just going, a mother is going to know that's her baby if that's her baby. You know, I was just like, they're going to know that's their baby. I thought, and that's all was going through my mind is what in the world are they going to do when they wake up and, uh, and and finding out uh, later, she had already known that Bailey uh, was deceased. She'd already ID'd her, but she didn't know about the photo either at all until the next morning. Uh, oh they, they had gone to stay at her grandparents' house. And she said she knew something was wrong because when she gets up in the mornings at her grandparents, they're always in there drinking coffee and reading the paper. And there was no newspaper. And she asked them, she said, where's the newspaper? And they said, oh, we something about didn't get it this morning or something. She said, I knew they were lying. She said, I just kept begging them. What, what are you hiding from me? What? And they showed her the paper. So that's the first time she knew the next morning that the baby was in that photo. My gosh. Hmm. And then you would see that photo countless times more. And I imagine that every um, anniversary, the one year, the five year, Every year, every year, you see that photo everywhere you go in Oklahoma City. They remember, do a remembrance ceremony every year, um, every single year. But the, you know, the media brings, but you know, it's really big on, like you say, the one, the five, the 10, the 15, the 20. So that's when they really, um, I, I, I don't go down there for the ceremony. Uh, I did a couple of years, just kind of be there for Aaron. And, uh, the local media has always been great to me, but, uh, if there's other national people there and if they happen to, they know what Aaron looks like. So if they see me, they know it's me and they want to start doing interviews and that's not what it's about. That's not what that day's about. So I just avoid even going down there because it's about those families and, and the people that were lost that day. And I don't want to be over here on the side doing some interview about the photo while, you know, while this is going on. So I pretty much avoid 
the uh, the ceremonies anymore, but uh, I think Aaron still goes to them. When you talk about the Oklahoma City bombing, that is the photo you think about. You don't have to look it up. You don't have to Google it. Mm-hmm. It's seared in my memory, and it it's so emotional. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. When I meet people, they find out who I am, that I'm the photo. Like you said, it still evokes quite a bit of emotion in people 23 years later when I meet them. Yeah. When do you meet Bailey's mom? And at what point do you even know Bailey's name? Like what, you know what I mean? What? Um, Aaron was friends with a local reporter named Cynthia Gunn. She said she wanted to meet me and Sergeant Avery. And so Cynthia Gunn calls my, gets my number and calls my house and says, hey, the the mother of Bailey, and that's when I, for the first time, heard the name Bailey. She said, uh, Bailey Almond, the child you were holding, her mother wants to meet you. And I, my first, I said, nope. <laughs> I said, I, I, I don't think I can do it. And uh, why are you saying no? Um, because I didn't, I've, uh, I felt responsible for her being in that position, for getting the attention she was getting, and for holding her baby. Is she going to blame me for not doing enough? Is she going to ask me why I couldn't do more? I mean, you know, just let me back up. She said, would you like to meet the mother of the baby? And I said, no, for those reasons I just stated. And then she said, well, she wants to meet you. Well, then I didn't have a choice. I mean, I was like, well, then I'll meet her. That's what she wants. So yeah. that afternoon, uh, me and Sergeant Avery, along with our families, went and met uh, Aaron over at her grandparents' house. And uh, she had a picture of Bailey. She told us that Bailey had just turned one year old the day before on April 18th. And uh, the first thing she did was hug us and thank us. And uh, we were like, I think we were both taken back about, you know, but it was kind of, me and Sergeant Avery, we're just like, we just broke down. So here's this, uh, you know, 20-year-old single mom that just found out her baby's passed away really kind of comforting me and Sergeant Avery and uh, tells you what kind of, you know, how strong she was. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, she thanked us and in our minds, I think she knew we were going, why are you thanking us? Because she answered that question immediately after she said, thank you. She just want to thank y'all because I know the fate of my, of Bailey. She said, there's a lot of, of course, it's only the second day after the bombing. She said, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, are still waiting, still, that don't, still, still searching, right? Still searching and don't know. And uh, she was just thankful for the way she said uh, she could tell by the way we handled Bailey that we were both dads, and she really appreciated that. So then, what happens? Just kind of went on about life for the next, uh, you know, still being consumed by, a, you know, I see Aaron moving on with life, but still, I'm just like the guilt still still eating me up for everything and uh just went on i'm always the i'm chris fields the happy go lucky guy always the funny guy i mean that's just life of the party guy you know that kind of little facade went on for about about eight years i live like that it's one event it's one deal but man it was just like like i said it was just eating at me and eating at me and uh i was able to pretty much like I say just you know, throw on the old smile and fake it and go on down the road. Uh, I kept, kept up the good, uh, the good strong face when I was at the fire station, but at at my home life, that's when I kind of started to, uh, kind of isolate and kind of detach a little bit. And, uh, I don't know, just, uh, kind of like into a depression, not really worried if I was going to be off duty to make my son's sporting events that I've coached when they were in little league and, things like that. And it just kind of, uh, it progressed. It was, it not until later on that somebody said, Hey, this is what's going on with you. Uh, you know, I, I felt it, but I figured the only people that really knew was uh, were here at the house and uh, my wife and, and the kids were still, uh, fairly young. They were six and 16. That should have been a pretty good sign that I was having trouble that I was putting my I was putting the the legacy, my legacy with the fire department ahead of my family. Uh, 
which is, you know, it's pretty humiliating to look back on and, uh, and say that, but I was, I was more worried about what the guys and the girls at the fire department thought about me than my, than my own family. I was more comfortable taking care of them and making sure all their needs were met than I was when I, than I was concerned with my own family. And, uh, you know, it just came to a, a point to where, uh, my wife gave me some, you know, you need to go talk to somebody, you need to go get help. You're not the same. This isn't you, Chris, you know, you're, and your, uh, your, your priorities were out of whack. Priorities were way out of whack. And, uh, so I played the game. I went and got a little, I knew what was best for me, you know? <laughs> so I went to a couple of counseling deals just because they wanted me to. And, uh, of course, you know, I, I, one of the things I like to tell people is you can't go not knowing it was PTSD then, you know, just thinking I was kind of depressed, and like, but there's just certain things you need to go to certain counselors for. And, uh, you can't go to a regular family counselor and describe things you see on the job as a first responder, because next thing you know, you got your counselors are needing counseling. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, did, I ran into that. And so, uh, yeah. Uh, things just kind of started to spiral out of control a little bit. I started to, uh, always enjoyed the occasional, uh, you know, uh, crown and Coke, <laughs> which I, which I do, but I got to where I was putting a little less Coke, Coca-Cola in there. And, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it wasn't to physically function. It was to mentally not function. Does that make sense? It was to, uh, you know, kind of help me go to sleep at night. Well, then just drown start, it out. Yeah, I drowned it out. Well, and then I started to start drowning it out, hanging with the hanging with the boys, hanging with the firefighters on their days off. Like I say, putting my family way down the old priority list, running with people I shouldn't have been running with. There was uh uh there was an extramarital affair that went on. There was uh, just a lot of things that that I was not being the husband or the father or really even the man I should be. And uh and so I thought moving out, living on my own was the best for me. That went on for you probably year and a half two years that we were separated and that's probably one of the more um probably one of the most humiliating things that i do talk about you know leaving my 16 17 year old son at home to be the man of the house um because i wanted to be selfish people ask me what was your what was your really your turning point and i said you know i just got i got tired of being me and at this point are you still thinking i mean do you realize you have ptsd that this these events are all related to this issue that you're having that these um, are all ripple effects uh you know i i really didn't i i was still focused on i was still focused on the bombing and the photo and let's help me deal with this and everything's gonna be good that was kind of my you know that's kind of why i said you know i'm gonna go still not thinking ptsd just thinking depression and you know to look at it now and say it, it was a blessing because it's, it was a catalyst for me to get through a lot of, uh, unprocessed trauma that I've, that I've experienced both on the job and off the job. So when you say unprocessed trauma and you, not just from that day, mm -hmm. but a culmination of what had been going on, what you de deal with on uh -huh. the daily with your career. I was diagnosed with, went to a, a lady, uh, here in a town by Oklahoma city that, uh, uh, diagnosed me with PTSD. I went to a, uh, retreat, a first responder retreat place out in California for first responders dealing with PTSD. Um, uh, probably one of the greatest things I've done, uh, was going there, being with other first responders, not just firefighters. Would you say that was your turning point, Chris, when you went to that? That, there's, there's two things. That was a huge turning point. And immediately when I got back, I went back to my, the counselor I've been going to here and wanted to do this uh, EMDR therapy. You have to be willing to participate, you know, and, and focus on issues and, uh, and that right there was a big turning point, a turning point because it, uh, that's where I really unleashed all my other, all my other stuff. I was still kind of dealing with just to back up a little bit, you know, 1995 when the bombing happened, 
I really don't know if I'd even heard the term PTSD. If I had, it was on a story on the news about a homeless Vietnam vet. I'm, you know, that's, that's what PTSD was pretty much relegated to back then. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't in the first responder world. It was a military thing. You know, that's, that was the farthest thing from my mind. So like I say, to do the, the, to do the EMDR therapy and open up a whole kind of all that stuff, like in a, it's a cliche or an example they all use, you just keep stuffing all this stuff in a closet, stuffing it, stuffing it, stuffing it. And, and you know, and all of a sudden you open up that closet, and it all just kind of comes down on top of you. And, and that's what happened to me in, in, in treatment. Hmm. I'm looking it up, Chris. Here's what <laughs> EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy is an interactive psychotherapy technique used to relieve psychological stress, an effective treatment for trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Uh, just kind of puts you in a relaxed state where you can focus. And it got to the point to where she would ask me about, uh, a certain question, you know, well, well, Chris, tell me about this, you know, and well, at the end or even before I got to what the question was, my mind was going and I would, I would bring up another issue or I would bring up, you know, so it was, um, you had a lot to say and yeah, you had a lot, you had a lot in your closet. I had a lot of garbage in. Yeah. I had a lot of garbage in that didn't have nowhere to go or I didn't think it did. <laughs> You said to me, it, it took me 23 years to come to terms with what happened. Mm -hmm. I say 23 years because that's how long ago the bombing was. So it took me 23 years to come to terms with stuff that happened 40 years ago. It took that bombing. It took that photo. It took that to put me in a position to where I was, I had to, had to talk about it and get it out of good help or I was going to, you know, um, and one part I did skip over and I, I shouldn't because I want people to know, uh, you know, there was, there were suicidal thoughts when I was at the end of my rope and had humiliated my family and my friends and, you know, and pushed them aside. And so it took me 23 years because of that, the bombing vote to get to a point to where, uh, you know, I guess bottom line is mamas are always right because that was my mom told me from the day it happened. She always said that she goes, there is a reason why you were, why you were in that photo. And, uh, you know, looking back, she was right now that to, to see, see it come full circle and to know that, you know, Bailey's mom, Aaron is in full support and she loves it that I talk about Bailey when I talk to people and because now you talk to people, now you've turned your experience into something positive that you want to give back, right? Exactly. That's, uh, this, these, the, this photo that was so symbolic and so iconic for the world of this tragic day meant something else to you. Exactly. To me, I mean, it's still a symbol of the Oklahoma City bombing. I know that, but to me it is, it is so much more. It was, uh, you know, looking back, it was a pretty pivotal, pivotal time, time in my life. Because of that, I'm, I've got the best marriage right now. My, 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 me and my sons have a, you know, great father, son slash friend relationship. Uh, all the friends that, you know, that I probably humiliated and kicked to the side are all strong part of my life now. And uh, so, yeah, it's just come full circle. I get excited when people call me and ask if I want to come, uh, come speak. I go to some things where there's some teachings going on or whatever. And I just tell them, you know, I don't, I don't have any little fancy initials after my name or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or anything. I just, uh, I just tell my story, what I lived. So I do. I love it. That's great, Chris. That's really beautiful. Well, thank you. What is your point to people at the end? Uh, <laughs> you want people to know what? People that aren't first responders experience trauma in life also. But when I'm speaking to the first responders, I just tell them, you will have an event that affects you traumatically. I don't care how long you're on the job. You're going to, you know, I don't care if you're a volunteer career, 
You're going to have things that affect you traumatically. And what I went through, you do not have to go through. I just always want to re- reassure them that if you experience it, it's okay to reach out and ask for help. I actually refer to it as PTSI, post-traumatic stress injury, because disorder has such a stigma to it. Uh, it sounds permanent. You know, you got a disorder. It sounds like it's something permanent that can't be fixed. An injury, PTSI, that's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a brain injury. It's, n- uh, it's no different than having a knee injury, getting it cut on and going through rehab, and you can go back to work. Same thing with this. You go, you get your brain worked on, you rehab it, and you go back to work. You can uh, heal. You, you, can, you can heal from it. Uh, There's healing, yes. When I reached out, I was shocked at how many people were reaching back to help. It is, uh, it's absolutely, it's, it's humbling, and it's overwhelming to see how many people are actually willing to help. Everybody's trauma is different, and I always relate it to uh, baby Jessica, 1987 in Midland, Texas. Uh, the baby that was, Jessica was in the well. Um, Robert O'Donnell was the firefighter who is pictured, you know, holding her at the end. Basically, baby Jessica was, um, I want to say she was 18 months old and she had fallen into an abandoned water well in Midland, Texas. 50 something hours. 58 hours she was trapped. And she fell through this eight inch wide opening of this abandoned well where she was yeah. playing with children in the backyard. It's just a regular day at this yeah. home daycare. So she drops 22 feet into the well and she got stuck. And she there, she was there for two and a half days while on live TV. So yeah. when I talk about viral before viral, this was it. And there were only three channels and right. everybody was tuning in and they were trying to see, are they going to get to her right. in time? It was incredible. I mean, it's kind of like that that uh, incident recently uh, in Thailand, right? Exactly. Where people were watching those, uh, those boys stuck in that cave. Yep. So people were glued to their television sets and glued to their radio back in 1987. Mm -hmm. I just thought I would set that up for you, Uh, Chris, because I don't think people, some people may not not know, you know, there were mining experts and volunteers and just people around the clock trying to figure out if they could build this parallel shaft, you know, to get to her because she was trapped. And one of the things I remembered is, you know, the reporters would say like, we can hear her crying or they, you know, then we'd get a report and, and they'd go back to it and they'd say, we can hear her humming. <laughs> and, and, and she was singing yeah. throughout the, she was singing like uh, Winnie the Pooh songs. <laughs> so imagine that this, she's 18 months old, stuck in this tiny little space. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we're talking about. Baby Jessica who did make it out. They did get to her. Right. And? And I appreciate the setup because like I say a lot of people don't. And I do that when I talk about the bombing because I realize a lot of people I'm talking to at some of these first responder deals weren't even born in nineteen. Time moves on, man. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, some of them weren't even born. So I have to I show a little video. But anyway, yeah, like you said, they got to her. Uh, what they did was Robert O'Donnell was the paramedic. He was a skinny little dude. So they got this. I think if I read it right, it's like a, they were able to drill another hole vertically down and there's something next to it. I can't remember how it worked. But it's like an 18 inch. It wasn't very big. They covered him and they covered his entire body in KY jelly and slid him down this pipe. I think they said he was down there almost, almost an hour himself, uh, hanging, trying to get her. And he ended up using a tripod from a photographer to hook onto her clothing and pulled her up and of course there's the picture and like you said what a great day you know they they saved her she went on to live a great life uh you know he's he was going back to work at the fire station well even though it had a great positive outcome that was extremely traumatic on him he ended up uh 
Now, I'm, I can't just reading articles. I don't want if his family, I don't want to say it's confirmed, but reading articles, he was released from the Midland Fire Department for abuse of prescription drugs. Uh, he just couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle the uh, probably the attention he got from the photo. Um, so fast forward to 1995, after the bombing, the day after the bombing, or two days when the photo came out of me and Bailey, he goes to his ex-fire chief and says, these people in Oklahoma have no idea what they're going to need lots of counseling. Then he laid that photo of me and Bailey on the deal. And he said, this guy right here has no idea how his life's going to change. Wow. Uh, four days later, he leaves a note for his 10 and 12 year old sons. that says, sorry to check out this way, but life sucks. Drove across the family ranch and, and put a gun to his head, shotgun to his head and took his own life. Um, my God, you know, and that's, like I say, it's one of them things to where to what we don't think is traumatic, uh, to some may be traumatic. And, and that was part of our story too. My wife got a call at the hospital that she was working at, at the time from, we still don't know this day who it is that there was a report that I was, people saw me wheeled into a, uh, emergency room that I had put a gun to my head and blown my brains out because everybody took the story and heard firefighter in the red hat because he had a red ball cap on i had a red helmet on but a firefighter in a red hat holding the baby killed himself so people around here reacted and call, actually called my wife at work to say that they had heard that i had killed myself <laughs> so oh my gosh yeah. oh yeah that was just part of the that was another interesting turn on the deal but so when you talk about robert o'donnell so you talk about that in your presentation Right. I mean, yes. I, it sounds to me the way you describe it, like that the Oklahoma City bombing, that that picture was the trigger for him. Without it, without a doubt. Yeah. Because like I say that's exactly the photo he put on the desk and told him that I had no idea how my life was going to change. And then two or three days later, he went and, and took his life. So definitely, definitely that was a trigger for him. But, you know, he was right when he put that photo down in front of his boss and said, this guy has no idea what's about to happen to him. His life's about to change. Uh, he was, he was correct. And, uh, I kind you know, I kind of wish, I wish he, maybe they would have sought out, you know, I've had other people track me down. I wish maybe they would have tracked me down, you know, and maybe I, we could have talked and maybe things would be different. Who knows? You know, yeah. but, uh, so, but yeah, it's a well, tragic deal. Well, you're talking now yes. and you are spreading your message now. And we so appreciate that. Well, thank you. And I thank you for this time on here to, to spread it a little more and get the word out. What you were dealing with all that time is now your platform. Yes. I always want to honor the, the hundred and, you know, 168 people, including Bailey that were, taken that day because that's where my that's where my platform to to go help save lives comes from so thank you so much chris fields for being on inside crime best of luck to you in everything you do thank you so much and thank you so much again for having me and that's it for this episode of inside crime i'm your host angeline hartman for more information about today's episode please visit our website insidecrime.com Thank you to all of our listeners out there for tuning in. We appreciate your feedback. And if you're a new listener, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode of Inside Crime.